The Queen continues to experience episodic mobility problems and in consultation with her doctors has reluctantly decided that she will not attend the state opening of Parliament tomorrow. At Her Majesty's request, and with the agreement of the relevant authorities, the Prince of Wales will read the Queen's speech on Her Majesty's behalf, with the Duke of Cambridge also in attendance. Today marks an unparalleled moment in Her Majesty's reign. This is the first time in 70 years that she has delegated authority to the Prince of Wales to read the Queen's speech, which is one of the chief functions of royalty. Her Majesty has only missed two Queen's speeches during her reign, and she was pregnant on both of those occasions. In those instances, the Lord Chancellor read her speech through authority of a royal commission of five privy councillors. But this time, a new letters patent was formalised on Monday evening. It was authorised by the Queen to specifically cover the state opening, delegating the royal function of opening a new session of Parliament to councillors of state. No other functions have been delegated. This is not a moment where Prince Charles will take up regency, but this decision would have been highly reluctantly taken by Her Majesty. The only other time in history that a Prince of Wales read out the monarch's speech was during the regency of the early 1800s. In the event that the Queen can't undertake her duties as sovereign, on a temporary basis. Two or more councillors of state are appointed by letters patent to take her place. And by law, these councillors of state would have included the late Prince Philip, who's no longer with us, and then the next four members of the royal family in the line of succession over the age of 21, namely Charles, William, Harry and Andrew. As we know, two members of those councillors of state are indisposed right now. That is why you see the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Cambridge representing Her Majesty today. This delegation of powers to the councillors of state is made by letters patent under the great seal of the realm and is signed by the Queen. Prince Charles and William acted today with the Queen's specific delegated authority to keep the country running. The Prince of Wales read on her behalf with the Duke of Cambridge present to make it constitutionally sound. In case any of you aren't familiar with the state opening of Parliament, the Queen's speech is not written by the Queen, it's written by government, whichever party happens to be in power at the time, and is presented to the Queen who reads it on behalf of her government. Prince Charles looked exquisitely handsome. He outshined Big Willie. Exquisitely looked in his fineries and his decorations with Camilla. Of course, his uh, Charles's training as an actor, which was one of his favourite hobbies as a youth and one of his continued interests as an adult, in particular Shakespeare, of course came in handy with his immaculate reading. In place of Her Majesty's throne was an empty space, and the crown was placed on a table. Prince Charles sat in the consort's throne, which was set slightly lower than is usual. And for the first time we find ourselves in the peculiar position of watching proceedings on telly alongside with Her Majesty, who's no doubt settled down comfy and cosy, watching the goings-on and watching her son do a fine job. A very bittersweet moment for Her Majesty, who quite obviously would prefer to be doing the job herself, but must be taking an enormous pride in her son at this moment in time. The speech itself, as usual, was incredibly boring. Uh, it drives me out of my mind with boredom, all these promises from government. So there's no easy way to jazz it up. It is what it is. People were run wondering how Charles was going to express because it's usually read along the lines of my government will do this that, and the other, my ministers will do such and such. And it, it, he plumped to say Her Majesty's ministers will, Her Majesty's government will, in her place, because in the past it's been read out in her wording. When the Lord Chancellor did it on those two occasions, I believe he read it out in her words as my government in the words that Her Majesty was, would use. My government, my ministers. 
quite interesting, the change that in this instance, it was made very clear that the Prince of Wales, you know, even clearer than before, that the Prince of Wales was speaking on behalf of Her Majesty and that he is not a regent as yet and not a sovereign. We spoke recently about the Regency Act of 1937 when we were speaking about the possibility of Charles at some point taking the reins. If that moment comes when Her Majesty's mind or body or a mixture of the two becomes too overwhelming for her to carry out her royal functions and duties, that time has not yet come. But it is indeed that Regency Act of 1937 that made it possible through letters patent for this delegation of authority to take place on this one occasion. And it is the first time that it's been used to hand responsibility to other members of the royal family. I will hesitate from calling this a grave moment in Her Majesty's reign, because to the best of our knowledge, although she has mobility problems, her general health seems to be free of illness, either of the body or of the mind. From what we know, these are practical, logistical issues, episodic, that are preventing her from carrying out certain duties. We are also blessed that she is surrounded with a supportive family in England, whose devotion and support to their mother and her mother's reign, and therefore to this nation, is undiminished. As many of you know, the young Princess Elizabeth was totally unaware that her destiny was to become queen. She only became aware that this was going to be her fate around about the age of 10 years old. And from that moment on, her training began in earnest. And it was Queen Mary at the helm that had a profound influence on her. As Queen Consort back in the day, Queen Mary had an abundance of reverence for constitutional monarchy and for the crown. It was protect the crown at all costs. Her first action as mother to a king when her son inherited the throne was to kiss his hand and proclaim that she was now his subject, her own son. And she had the same respect for her granddaughter, Princess Elizabeth, who would go on to become our beloved queen. She shepherded Her Majesty throughout her young life, and one of the rigours of the Queen's education was a, a deep understanding of the Constitution. Her Majesty knows the Constitution as well as any historian. She has an in-depth, profound understanding of what that Constitution means, both locally, domestically, and abroad. Throughout what used to be referred to as the Dominions, and later came to be known as the realms. The gravity of that undertaking was impressed upon Her Majesty from the off and has always been fully understood and appreciated by her. That is why today's decision by Her Majesty is so utterly profound, because it is in her constitution, the constitution of that very frame that houses the spirit of Her Majesty, it is part of her very metal and mantle of royalty to carry out her functions and duties to the best of her ability for as long as she can. So, as I said, I hesitate to use the word grave. It is not a grave moment for the Queen, but it is certainly full of gravity. It is a weighty day in the Queen's history from the moment last night when this was formalised. And it also happened yesterday on the Monday to coincide with another historic event. Yesterday, Her Majesty became the third longest serving monarch in the history of the world. She nudged into fourth place Prince Johann II of Liechtenstein, who reigned for 70 years and 91 days. She just toppled him off of that post and she's uh, got the bronze medal at the moment, but she's not far off reaching the silver. She's only a few weeks or months away from catching up with number two on the list, who was a ruler of Thailand, who ruled for 70 years and 126 days. Fingers crossed, she will continue on to reach the top spot of the world's longest reigning monarch of all time. 
and she's only got a couple of years to go to reach that milestone. The current number one is Louis XIV of France, who ruled for 72 years and 110 days. It's also known as the Gracious Speech. It sets out the legislation that Parliament aims to introduce. For those of you that don't know, and I'm sure most of you do, Prince Charles is the longest serving heir to the throne in British history. So if you think it's been tough on Her Majesty upholding the longest reign in British history, imagine what it's like for the one that has to wait around twiddling thumbs all that time. I think we're very lucky to have a man in Charles who is a romantic, who appreciates our traditions and customs. And despite criticism he's faced throughout his life for human frailties, his dedication to service and duty and reverence for it, as well as reverence for his own mother and her reign, is unquestionable, absolutely unquestionable. It's been an immaculate life of service since he was created Prince of Wales. I heard the rumblings in the press this week, and perhaps some of you did too, the rumblings that William and Catherine, in response to recent criticism of them, which is mainly media generated, a few nobodies, that becomes the big news, you know, one hears tell that they want to revolution, revolutionise the monarchy, jazz things up and drop the use of their royal titles, uh, apart from on very official business, they want to get rid of bowing and curtsying and all the rest of the, the showmanship, the theatre. And I do appreciate that my view on this won't be the majority view, but from where I stand, royalty without the pomp and circumstance, royalty without at least some of the deference, is not royal. <laughs> it's quite simply not royal. When it comes to monarchy, I'm an all or nothing kind. And I'm hoping that perhaps one of the functions of Charles, Charles's reign with his consort Queen Camilla might be to bolster that period of time between Her Majesty's reign and William's. This period where em empire, colonialism is controversial and said to be unfashionable. But it's very curious, you know. I've been reading that book by Richard Dimbleby that was released and given free to many schools, actually, during the year of Her Majesty's coronation. Richard Dimbleby knew the Queen. He narrated her coronation. And uh, it's very interesting, you know. It speaks in the... Nothing is new under the sun, is it? And you look back to the golden days, and I, I, I'm guilty of this, and think, well, everyone there was so much more deferential to royalty. And there's no getting away from the fact that they absolutely were, and the nation was far more united. There was far more of a singular purpose and religion and culture. There's absolutely no question about that. Now it's uh, a hodgepodge. But empire as is described in this, uh, this book, was also uh, a dirty word in Elizabeth's young days, when she was uh, Princess Elizabeth, when she was Duchess uh, of Edinburgh. Uh, th there was still a lot of ill feeling towards that word. And words, as I've mentioned before, like dominions, which were used during Victoria's reign, had to be reimagined as realms so that they sounded less grand. If I may quote from the book for a moment, abroad our fortunes seemed no happier. The term empire had acquired a sudden opprobrium, and India's movement towards an independent republicanism had been feared by many to be the first step of a general dissolution. India made it plain, however, that although she desired a republican status, she had no wish to leave the Commonwealth, and it was the late King George VI who did much behind the scenes to reconcile these wishes of the Indian government. Even though Princess Elizabeth's great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, uh, and her proud title, Empress of India, would no longer be inherited by that royal bride, the Indian people were willing to recognise her as head of the Commonwealth, for which they remained members. So all these controversies are nothing new under the sun. 
been there, done that, dealt with them. All these fashions have come and gone. So maybe by the time Prince Charles has had his reign and William's moment comes, the charms of royalty might be back in vogue. Uh, because once glamour has gone, once splendour, pomp and circumstance and a bit of theatre are gone, they will be missed. I think it would be rather sad to have a society where there's just some husk of royalty. But that's for future generations to decide. And if they haven't been taught to appreciate and love the beauty and romance of royalty, what it symbolises and what it illuminates for the imagine of the whole world, then that's to their detriment. It's to their detriment that it lacks such imagination. All our lives are built on imagination. That's all everything is, you know, that's all we are. That's all our bodies house in the human spirit, our imagination. Everything you see, sense and perceive, whether it's religion, whether it's love or royalty, begins and ends with our imagination. And that's what makes the world fun. And I don't underestimate fun or joy. Some people do. I'm simply thinking aloud, but I think the point I'm trying to get across is that I truly hope that the Cambridges aren't overwhelmed by the notions of apparent criticism that they get. And I don't want them to begin playing to that crowd. The same crowd that their in-laws might play to. I think they should play to the crowds that love them and focus on that. The crowds that love the glitz, the glamour, the sparkle, the traditions. And I do hope that the beauty of this ceremony isn't lost on those coming up in the generations in this country because there is such beauty in this ritual. You can still feel the stillness in the air as the crown emerges through the door and glitters and you have a fund of bated breath, a fund of atmosphere, of excitement, of reverence. Even those with a cynical mind have to catch their breath uh, at the, the majesty of such a moment and such a ritual of ancient tradition. We also saw David, the Marcus of Chumley, carrying the crown in his role. He is the hubby of Rose Hambry, of the, those nonsense rumours of Rose and William and their alleged affair, which is all a nonsense on stilts. He is her proud husband and proud carrier of the crown. The upcoming Jubilee might also help impel the nation into a bit more of a much needed national spirit because everybody loves a party and it'll also give schools up and down the country the chance to, if they're not already overtaken by the woke, uh, it'll give them the chance to have a little education on the history of monarchy and the Queen perhaps, that hopefully won't be a biased, potted history. But it get, it's getting everybody in the nation involved and you're about to see one of the biggest parties of all time, uh, certainly uh, this side of the millennium anyway, approaching. Uh, because we've got a gallop through history, a four day event which begins in advance of the Jubilee and then, of course, the actual main full day event coming up a couple of weeks afterwards. But everything is gearing up. There is a sense of the, the felicity and festivity in the air already, and one hopes of jubilation. Ten of Her Majesty's great-grandchildren will be appearing, riding in a carriage at, the, at that gallop through history for a pageant at the Royal Windsor Horse Show. And other members of the family are being sent to the other three nations, aside from England, to, that comprise the Union to underline the importance of all of our home nations. The Cambridges will be sent to Wales, Anne is off to Scotland, and the Wessexes are off to Northern Ireland to represent on Her Majesty's behalf for part of these celebrations. Due to the historical importance of today's event, I'm going to draw this broadcast to a close uh, to keep everything on the subject today. Uh, because it is a truly momentous occasion and uh, our congratulations must go to the Prince of Wales for carrying out his duties so royally and we must all of course send our best wishes and love, energetically speaking, to Her Majesty.
Thank you for marking this occasion with me. Thank you for joining me. And I look forward to seeing you in the next broadcast. Thank you to those of you who have sent me a tip in the tip jar. It was most kind of you. And I'll catch up with you very soon. Toodle pip.